Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Marlon Montgomery. I am a solutions architect and a product lead for Signal, which is Globant's OTT uh, platform as a service. Uh, here to talk to you today about the good, the bad, the ugly of the OTT uh, industry. Uh, a little summary of observations and experiences that I've had over the past a uh, couple of years uh, building platforms and delivering uh, solutions out there. Uh, a bit of, about my experience uh, for the past 20 years or so, I've been working on the technology side and the creation and the delivery of content across various mediums and platforms uh, that covers experience in uh, broadcast production, uh, web, VR, VRML, uh, games for consoles and uh, handheld feature animation, visual effects, uh, and now OTT for the past uh, five years. So starting off with uh, some of the good things in the industry. One, um, the industry is growing, right? Uh, it's not dying down. Currently, there are 250 million paying subscriber households uh, globally. Uh, that's expected to hit 300 million by the end of the year and 450 million by 2022, so in about five years. We'll almost have half a billion users actually paying subscribers. Comscore recently came out with a report, and out of all US Wi-Fi households, 63% are streaming video currently. Uh, that translates to about 59 million households, and on average, they're streaming 50 hours uh, a month of content. And breaking that down uh, a bit further, there are two buckets, the heavy streamers, which my son and daughter are definitely a part of, <laughs> and the light streamers. Heavy streamers, on average, are streaming nine times more content than the light streamers. Uh, that translates into uh, 90 hours a month versus uh, 20 minutes a day for uh, the light streamers. And breaking it down even further, and talking about the cord cutters and the cord nevers, um, out of these 59 million people, 18%, so almost 20% are cord cutters. So they've made the transition from pay TV to OTT streaming services only. And 14% are uh, cord nevers, so they've never paid for cable or satellite uh, services at all. So that, that was actually a pretty surprising number for me, but of course generations are, are growing and moving out and, <laughs> and streaming. And video is not going uh, anywhere. Uh, Cisco is projecting that by the year 2021, 82% of all internet traffic will be video. That's pretty astounding. The second item, the one that's been on everybody's mind for the past year or two is AI and machine uh, learning. And there have been a number of great applications from AI and uh, machine learning um, in the OTT uh, space. This, of course, all started with uh, deep neural networks powering personalization and recommendation and discovery uh, engines. And uh, one of the numbers that are out there, uh, Netflix put this out about a year and a half ago, two years ago, that they are saving a billion dollars from their AI-based recommendation engines, cutting reducing churn and uh, increasing user engagement. And that was about two years ago. So imagine what that number might be now, what they're saving. Uh, in addition, uh, AI has been great for supplementing the media workflow. Uh, we just heard earlier about automated uh, tagging, uh, metadata generation, automated translations, uh, et cetera. Uh, Netflix, again, is leading uh, some of the newer applications. Um, on the delivery side. So the first uh, one of that would be uh, encoding based on content. So they're actually analyzing the content and determining how to encode that video to save on bits so that gets delivered at the right quality for the device at the, and at the right speed, reducing bandwidth. In, in addition, uh, now AI is being implemented on the pipeline side as well. Uh, using machine learning to detect potential bandwidth issues and congestion periods and routing the content or the delivery uh, in different pipes 
to make sure uh, that content gets to the user with uh, minimum latency issues or uh, buffering uh, issues, which is pretty exciting, especially for those that are uh, using handhelds while, while, while traveling, uh, et cetera, a and in uh, markets where the bandwidth is not that great. Um, other applications, um, one area that Globant is investing in is uh, voice control on the application side, so being able to navigate through um, your OTT service by voice without using the remote. Uh, there's also live dynamic ad insertion that's powered by AI with personalization based on geotargeting and user preferences. And a couple of my favorite examples other than the Netflix billion dollar savings are one, uh, 20th Century Fox uh, created a trailer for Morgan about a year and a half ago. Um, there's an AI algorithm that built uh, the trailer and got successful scores from a, a focus group and did that in minutes rather than uh, going through the whole editorial process and focus groups trying to pick out the, the, the scenes. And the second was uh, IB M's experiment with the US Open in 2017 using their Watson uh, powered engine where they were able to create highlights from each match uh, within minutes, minutes of the match completing and get, getting that out to all the uh, uh, broadcasters and uh, distributors. On the back end side, we've been really excited about the whole movement towards the serverless, serverless architecture and microservices and uh, containerization. All the signals, content, and application services are leveraging uh, serverless architecture, providing high availability and uh, scalability. Uh, some of the benefits, obviously, are redundancy and resiliency for the high availability. Uh, continuous uh, scaling without having to make those projection, projections in advance. A uh, sub-second billing model, which is fantastic for cost savings. Uh, the ease of provisioning, right? We don't have to worry about bringing up servers, taking them down, et cetera. Uh, the elimination of maintenance, so don't have to worry about OSs and server maintenance and uh, servers going down. And then it's very easy to uh, separate the environments, so to build up a dev, QA, staging, production uh, environment and have that multi-tenancy as well. Another area that we're very excited about is the uh, headless uh, CMS. Uh, if you're not familiar with the headless CMS, that's basically a CMS that separates the back end and the content repository uh, from the front end uh, UI or the creation of the presentation. Um, what's exciting about this for us, it provides flexibility in not only the data modeling, uh, but the front end uh, implementation as well as we've been able to build our own uh, communication protocol with the uh, CMS that we're using um, to deliver content as we like it across all the different uh, native platforms and native apps that we're uh, building. Again, uh, benefits here are reduced time to market, uh, easy to use, uh, cloud scalability, and enhanced uh, security uh, that comes with it. As the headless CMS lives in the, uh, the cloud, uh, and not, or lives in the cloud and uses a CDN for delivering content. Uh, the security features come in because you're not calling the data from uh, the database uh, directly, so prevents the denial of service attacks. Some of the bad. <laughs> First, uh, the UI UX experience. And I'm a bit surprised that there hasn't been more innovation on the user experience on it and the applications. Um, if you download a new OTT app, you're still seeing a masthead and rails and, and, and grids, right? There, there isn't really anything there. Um, this is the biggest problem for the aggregators of the world in the OTT space, because it's very hard for them to compete on price as licensing has certain costs and the studios are uh, determining uh, the pricing to the end. Uh, consumer, their margins are very thin, so they're trying to differentiate on UI UX, but they're, they're pretty limited of what they can do, right? And part of that has to do with the fragmentation of the platforms and the capabilities of different platforms 
for smart TV versus an iPhone and Android or uh, a Roku, uh, for example. And uh, for the aggregators, right, Spider-Man is Spider-Man. So whether you buy it from Amazon or uh, watch it on Netflix or, or another uh, platform, right, the differentiation is based on the, that UI UX. Um, the EPG, so the program guide, uh, that's still pretty much mimicking the user experience from uh, pay TV and back from the Roby days, right? There hasn't really been a any innovation around uh, navigation other than some of the interaction through, through voice uh, around there. Um, the third piece is, is more uh, for the end uh, users. Right? There are a lot of templated uh, solutions out there. And a lot of these uh, solutions are just using HTML5 and wrapping them in their apps and pushing them out there to all uh, the devices, not taking into account uh, the nuances for each uh, platform. So it might be easy to navigate on your phone, but when you take that experience and you put it on the 10-foot experience, like a, a, a smart TV, it's not as easy to go through and type in your email address, for example, or, or, or your password, or to navigate with the uh, Apple TV remote, for, for example. Um, it's really tough to find the right balance of innovation versus what users are used to and a habit. Right? A lot of these companies don't want to be uh, what happened to BMW, right? I couldn't find a high resolution for the, B the iDrive. <laughs> but I've got this picture, and when iDrive first came out, right, everybody was freaking out, and they were <laughs> getting panned not only by the critics, but users weren't used to navigating and using a, a round uh, gear sh shift. So there's a, they're a bit scared. <laughs> Moving on to big data. Data is great, and you need it but the enormous amount of data being collected, uh, it's hard to make sense of it all. And sometimes the data points uh, do not match up. Uh, for example, I was talking to one of uh, my, my former uh, clients uh, the other day, and, and he was asking me how to make sense of the data he was looking at. Um, he's getting reports back from, I won't name names, four different providers. One is a CDN. Then he has analytics from his OVP, and then uh, a QoS, QoE analytics service, and then another popular uh, analytics third-party service. Right? And none of the data matched up across the four of them right? in terms of number of views, playthroughs. Uh, they were completely off. Right? He didn't know if uh, he was actually losing 75% of his users uh, after 10% or, or, or not. And uh, with all the fragmentation and all the different data, it, it's hard to get smart insights uh, across the whole customer journey or, or the value chain. And like I said, this is just creating confusion for the programmers uh, on how to use uh, the data. Monetizing OTT. All right, so outside of the big three, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon, and a handful of uh, folks like Crunch, Crunchyroll that have found their, their niche and learned how to monetize uh, their con content. Programmers are still trying to figure out how to best monetize OTT and what mix they need. Right? Should it be a subscription model? If it is a subscription model, uh, how many levels do they need a gold, silver, bronze package? Do they do a free, freemium, right? so a free trial? Or do they do an AVOD or TVOD or is it a mix? of all three. And I'm starting to hear rumbles from the consumers and um, friends that ask me, right? Uh, one, um, the whole skinny bundles and s is starting to get annoying because of all the fragmentation, right? Nobody wants to manage 10 different subscriptions. They're getting app fatigue. And they're starting to look at the pricing. Once you start subscribing to four or five six subscription packages, you're right back at your cable bill. The only benefit of the cable bill is you're getting the phone and the internet potentially uh, as well. So that's starting to be, become a worry. Uh, second, the increase in popularity in advertising in, in AVOD. 
for the newer generations, they've grown up watching Netflix, right, or, or YouTube before the ads. Now they're seeing all these advertisements, right, and they're like, what is this? This is like cable TV or broadcast TV. I'm not used to watching uh, these ads and these pre-rolls. I just want to get to my content. They want instant uh, gratification. And those of us that are a bit older that have been around saw some of that blowback back in the web 1.0 days when ad banners went wild, right? <laughs> we're just trying to close them and then we have the pop-up blocker, blockers, et cetera. And now that's starting to happen to OTT as well with advertising being the leading monetization model. Um, previous company I worked at had a uh, app platform and they, one of the, their features was actually a pop-up blocker <laughs> or prevention of pop-ups. Now to cover some of the ugly <laughs> industry, have a few battle scars from here. So the one thing that pulls my, that makes me want to pull my hair out the most and aggravates me, gives me headaches, is metadata. <laughs> I don't even want, know where to start on this. I can talk about metadata for 30 minutes on its own. But trying to make sense of all the different variables and permut permutations and chaos to, and mapping that to a programmer's needs and out to the applications in, in a proper, logical way that makes it easy uh, has become quite difficult. And this is across the board uh, with metadata. And although the automation of all the metadata from the AI machine learning has been great, it really scares me to have all that new data coming in without having any proper standards uh, in place or delivery mechanisms. And like I said, this is across the board. So uh, at Globant, and for the past five years, I've been working with some of the largest broadcasters and satellite providers and cable companies, et cetera. And it's amazing how their content uh, comes to them from the different programmers and producers. Right? Some providers that they work with send data in Excel spreadsheets and emails, and half the metadata is incomplete or misspelled or <laughs> it needs a lot of work. Right? Other times it's through a CSV. Sometimes it's in the XML. Sometimes you need to pull it from a remote FTP. Sometimes it's through uh, Espera. Other times you work with content aggregators right, that have five different programmers uh, or producers they work with. And all those formats are different from one particular company you're, you're working with. Uh, so that's uh, pretty hairy. Right? So that's the, the delivery. Then the taxonomy across that metadata, right? Uh, with something as basic as a genre. Right? Is it action? Is it action slash adventure? Is it action ampersand adventure? Is it action and adventure? And how does that map to how the OTT programmer wants to display their content in their UI, right? They don't want 5 million uh, genres with 20 of them being the same permutation uh, of the same practical uh, genre. Um, those are the easy ones. Then it gets into some of the more difficult taxonomy. Right? So I have a friend that works at Netflix, and he runs a department for metadata and tagging and making sure this data is all correct. And uh, he's telling me horror stories about uh, series, TV series, for example. Right? So it might be episode one, right? But is that episode one in the production order, or was that episode one based on the air date? Right? Oftentimes, episodes are shot in a different order than they're actually aired, and that data isn't changed. And so people have to go through and actually have to make sure it's the right order of what people expect and the right uh, storylines. Um, and while we're on episode numbers, right, it's not just the order. Again, like genre is how does that come through? Is it just a numeral? Is it episode one? Is it spelled out? Uh, there are millions of permutations <laughs> that, that come through. And again, this rolls downhill, right? So it's not just on the front end uh, of the value chain of how you ingest it, but it's how does that data get displayed in the app at the end of the day and um, et cetera. Then uh, besides 
those pieces, you start getting into content availability of images. Right? So is, are there the appropriate images for the content that comes through in the right sizes and in the right uh, format? Right? So oftentimes, a provider will want to feature uh, content. Uh, so you need a masthead with the right resolution. But you also need to resize that for uh, the thumbnails and the rails and the row lists and the grids, et cetera. But then there's another level of detail, right? So again, depending on how a pro programmer's UI is built, do you need images with a title burned in uh, to the image or with no title, right? And again, that depends if the app is displaying the title, the metadata below or on the image uh, itself. The third major headache that creates confusion is fragmentation. It generates mass chaos. And it's like putting uh, together a huge pu puzzle with oftentimes having the wrong pieces included or pieces that don't fit, and you're trying to wedge them uh, together. And, and again, like metadata, this is uh, across the board, across the whole uh, value chain. Right? So you're not only dealing with the different DRM and streaming pro uh, protocols and, and codecs, but on the developer side, on the app side, across the different devices. And Android itself is a, a monster, but when you're talking Android, iOS, uh, the, the consoles, the set-top boxes, the smart TVs, and trying to develop across all of them, that, that becomes a nightmare and a headache. And there is no universally agreed uh, data standard for gathering and formatting, storing, and exchanging uh, key data, going back to uh, the metadata, which makes it hard to deliver that unified experience to the uh, end consumer. And um, part of the problem here is that the big players are fully aware of the competitive edge uh, of data and having a proprietary system that they have no vested interest in working with uh, other developers or other hardware uh, creators to resolve it. Um, on the devices side, um, smart TV, luckily most of those are based on HTML5, so there's some consistency uh, across uh, smart TVs, but in terms of like Apple TV, Roku, uh, Fire TV, those are absolutely independent platforms and require different code and different skill sets, which uh, again, increases the cost for development and uh, to get your service out there if you want the wide spectrum. And then if you're an OTT provider, right, this makes you think, do you, do you want an all-in-one solution or do you want to go with the, the best of breed? If you go with the best of breed, you get all of those headaches that uh, I just listed. But if you go with the all-in-one, right, nobody's really great at everything. So you're going to sacrifice in, in, in certain areas. Um, and again, this is a, this is a whole value chain. It's not just on the development side or on the OTT provider side. It also affects the consumers. Like we mentioned earlier, uh, the fragmentation of the dis different subscription uh, services. Content is getting fragmented, right? They're used to watching uh, content on Bravo and on E and ABC, right? That might require them to get three different subscription services to find all of their content. And that's expensive. It's annoying to hop between uh, different uh, applications and makes it really hard to discover uh, not only their favorite content, uh, but recommendations for them across their uh, full likes. Um, so on opportunities front, uh, I've picked uh, a handful of areas that uh, we at Globant are uh, investing in uh, to try to get over some of these uh, bad and ugly issues that uh, we are seeing out there. Um, and we'll talk about uh, some of the future or potential future. So on the AI uh, side, one of the areas that we're investing in with our cloud provider partners is creating uh, a voice uh, service, but an agnostic uh, voice service, right? So it doesn't matter if you have Google Home or uh, Alexa or your choice of voice control, you'll be able to navigate 
uh, your application uh, through uh, our service and get around the uh, exclusive partnerships that some of these uh, providers uh, might have. Uh, in addition, uh, on the metadata uh, side, uh, we are working with partners uh, for the front end of the value cha chain on the ingestion side, right, to have an agnostic metadata service. So no matter what you throw us, and it could be uh, through SFTP, Aspira, or however, it will go into a bucket in the cloud and through machine uh, learning and AI and mapping to our provider's preferences. We will map the meta metadata uh, as well as generate uh, new uh, metadata uh, for them and ideally clean up uh, that metadata as well, reducing uh, the human cost of, of going through that. Going back to uh, AI, what does the future look like? Again, Netflix is leading the space here, and uh, they're starting to use AI to analyze their content programming. Right? So what shows do they want to produce uh, based on historical viewership of previous shows? They're looking at what shows they might want to bring back based on sentiment that's out there in the world on social media and what they're seeing through navigation of uh, favorite genres and favorite shows uh, on their service. Um, again, we'll see more of AI in the content uh, generation uh, side as well, right? So what actors are most popular for my service for a particular audience? Um, automatic uh, camera switching, switching, right? So if you have an interview, you, you won't need the camera switcher. It'll hop between uh, automated uh, on-screen graphics. So if someone's talking or if someone's playing a sport, you'll see their number, jersey number, the, their name, or statistics uh, come up. And we we'll saw some of that earlier in the Amazon uh, presentation. Uh, we'll have better rec recommendation engines, right? Uh, right now, uh, the recommendation engines are creating somewhat of a bubble, like the news feed that you're getting in, in Facebook, right? So we want recommendations uh, that you'll watch the content, but also will push uh, your limits. One of the areas uh, we are working on uh, as well is creating uh, data contracts. And this goes around the fragmentation of the different uh, the devices uh, that are out there. Right? So with Signal, we build uh, native applications, but we're abstracting uh, that layer, creating API services with a, uh, a data contract. Uh, to make it easy to de deploy across uh, the different applications in a consistent uh, manner and presentation. We're also taking the platform as a service to the next uh, level. Um, so investing in creating an IPaaS, so integration platform as a service. And I think this will be the first uh, true IPaaS solution in the industry where we are uh, wrapping the key uh, third-party modules that we integrate with, so e-commerce, uh, user management, uh, analytics, and abstracting that from the front end and delivering that through our common APIs and services to the various uh, platforms. Where do I see the monetization piece going? There really isn't the Amazon of the OTT world out there, right? And I'm surprised Amazon hasn't uh, jumped into this yet, but Going back to the fragmentation of content, uh, I really see that there will be an aggregator in the market within the next uh, couple of years, ideally. Not just aggregating existing content, but allowing uh, independent publishers to easily get their content out there and to allow users to create their own skinny bundles and pick and choose the content they'd like to see. On the OTT side, in general, I think there'll be a lot of investment on that last mile. Uh, increasing uh, the bandwidth in various tricks, whether that be peer-to-peer uh, -peer in, in the player using additional AI, uh, as I mentioned earlier, to uh, determine the best route uh, to the player. Uh, there will be maturing of the industry through trial and er error, better understanding on the workings of monetization and what's the best mix. And uh, I think there will be more innovation for the technology and, and a platform uh, as we learn uh, from the past mistakes. And a common theme through a pre presentation with standards, 
Uh, so this is a, a call out to the industry <laughs> if you'd like to, to work with us or any panels uh, across the board or if you're interested in uh, working and plugging into a, an iPaaS solution and we're not working with you yet, please reach out. We're always willing to collaborate. Thank you. And uh, you can email me at marlon.montgomery at globant.com. And there's the Twitter handle and the uh, LinkedIn. So welcome to connect with all you all. Thank you.